Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we'll, we'll have a trickle coming in uh, as they, after they pick up cookies and lunch. Want to thank you for coming, uh, being here, both uh, present and on Zoom, uh, for our final um, HMEI faculty seminar of the 2022-2023 season. Uh, this is when we've, we've come back fully to being in person with lunches and everything else. So I think it's, it's a great milestone for us. Um, and I, I can't think of a better way to uh, sort of end this, this great re-inaugural uh, run than Professor Emily Carter. Um, I, uh, I, I, I thought that I had pruned her bio to the point where I could actually go through it. Uh, and as I, as I read it, it, it is truly impressive. And uh, I had to, had to reassess my place in the world a few times as I went through. Um, so what I will do is, 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 I think many of us know uh, some of what Emily has achieved. I doubt all of us uh, know the full breadth. But she is currently uh, the Gerhard uh, R. Adlinger Professor uh, in Energy and the Environment and a Professor in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, the Adlinger Center for Energy and Environment, and Applied and Computational Mathematics here at Princeton. She is also at the uh, Department of Energy in Princeton's Plasma Physics Lab, the inaugural Senior Strategic Advisor for Sustainability Science at PPPL. Um, and she's leading there a number of initiatives, uh, including in geoengineering. I, I, you know, I, I'm, I was aware of Emily and impressed with Emily for a while, and I often wondered how it is that she did what she did. And I've had the fortune to work a bit with her recently, and 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 it turns out that it takes is uh, simple to how she's accomplished what she's accomplished. It's being really bright creative, and working really hard. So that's it. That's all you have to do. Uh, so anyway, uh, I am not going to go on beyond that. And I would just like to welcome and thank Emily for giving us this presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. It's been a pleasure being able to work more closely with you this past year. Can everybody hear me OK? OK, if, I, if somehow, I mean, even without the mask, if, if I always ask, you know, if you're in the back and you can't hear, just do this, OK? And I'll speak louder. Um, so um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a tour of the work that, you know, I'm wearing multiple hats. So I have the hat of, of professor. I'll tell you a little tiny bit about research, but very little, because this is a very broad audience. And I'm going to focus on. Um, the work that I'm doing both at Princeton Plasma Physics Lab in collaboration with also, as, as Gabe mentioned, with, with Princeton and with, and with GFDL. But also, um, I also have a hat um, uh, as the chair of a, um, of a National Academy study. And all of this is really about how do we reach this sustainable future. And it's something that I have been concerned with. Concerned is, to, is not strong enough a term. I've been consumed with, consumed with um, for more than 15 years. 15 years ago, I reoriented my research to work on sustainable energy technologies. And then I became the founding director of the Anlinger Center. Um, and that really uh, helped, uh, you know, I think, uh, shape in, in collaboration with what then was PEI and other parts of campus. Um, you know, what, um, what Princeton uh, has been able to do and continues to do in, in, in this area. Um, so when I think about our sustainable future, um, actually I found, I, did, I took it out because this, this is supposed to be a less than an hour talk, so I took it out, but I had found a slide from about 10 years ago that I used to show when I was the Anlinger director. And um, it's clear that we have to be, be using our, you know, more and more carbon-free electricity. Along with that, a huge part of what we have to do going forward is electrifying everything, basically, as I, as I said it's in my life. Um, and that includes you know, electri electrification of transport, building, um, and industries. And, and I've, I've put this in, uh, in, in orange because in many ways, I mean, we obvi obviously already have electric vehicles. And um, 
especially land-based vehicles. We, don't, we, we obviously have issues with respect to heavy duty transport. We know how to electrify buildings. Uh, industries are much more problematic, okay? Most industries rely on fossil fuels um, uh, to create heat uh, and, and work, okay? So uh, input, energy inputs, but essentially uh, mostly heat um, that is used to transform various chemicals into other chemicals or materials or fuels or what have you. And so it's a huge challenge and one that, that I think is the key, one of the key parts of the future is to electrify the entire industrial sector, which is responsible for roughly 30% of all CO2 emissions. Of course, as I just mentioned, we need still carbon neutral fuels for aviation and shipping. Um, uh, you know, we're, ne we're not going to be able to electrify large aircraft um, and, and very large ships, uh, uh, you know, and so we, we are going to need those energy dense fuels. This is something I work on in my, in my own research. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of, of, of talk and has been, um, you know, Rob Sokolow was, was certainly one of the first people to, to be uh, from here to think about CCS in particular, so CO2 capture, utilization, and storage. And, um, and, the, and the U is a, is a bit new, because a lot of times people have talked about CCS, and, and I was a bit provocative in my abstract, saying, what happens if uh, you know, communities don't accept CCS? They're worried about it. What are we going to do? So we have to find other ways, potentially. I'm not saying, you know, the, the fact is, you know, we scientists and engineers, there probably are people here who are not scientists and engineers, but I will say, I will speak for scientists and engineers, because I am one. You know, we tend to think, oh, we have a great technological solution. Of course people will adopt it. No, not of course. Okay, there's a huge part of the work that we're doing with respect to this National Academies um, study that I'll talk about that involves public engagement. It's critical that we um, address concerns. Otherwise, CCS may not be adopted widely, and therefore, we have to really think about utilization. And utilization will be part of the picture even if CCS is adopted. So then let's suppose um, all else, uh, you know, all, we do all these things and we still are in trouble. We have to think about possibly if there's no other choice, we may have to think about solar radiation management. And that another term, this is the, what I've been told is the politically correct term these days. Um, it's otherwise known as solar geoengineering, which I understand people don't like. I think they, they don't like the term engineering. I feel personally insulted by that, but okay. Um, anyway, um, speaking as a former dean of engineering in Princeton. Um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about what I think as a scientist or engineer we have an obligation to think about here. And, um, and so what I'm going to talk about is essentially opportunities both from the national lab perspective, so the PPPL perspective in particular since that's where I am um, leading uh, these efforts. And, um, and from the university perspective, so that's uh, my research hat, and then from the NASM perspective. So the National Academies bit is a, this is, uh, I'm chairing for the National Academies a three-year congressionally mandated study on carbon utilization. And so I'm, what I'm going to do is present to you um, some highlights from the first report. We have to, we have to, we were told to issue two reports. The first report they wanted in a hurry because they wanted it to inform investments in infrastructure. By, by the Department of Energy and by other um, parts of, of, of government, of the federal government. And so we got the first report published in December, and I'll tell you about a few aspects of that along the way. We are now working on the second report um, that's gonna go into much more depth and also about R&D. Okay, so let me tell you first about um, how I think about where we are and what, um, in particular, the work that I've initiated um, with the help of lots of, uh, of people at PPPL and Princeton and GFDL um, uh, related to this broad area of sustainability sciences. So I was brought back um, by, uh, by, uh, uh, to work, to lead these efforts to basically build stronger bridges between PPPL and Princeton and Washington, D.C. and beyond. And the idea is, you know, the way I think about this is that we have to, first of all, um, recover from the sins of the past, the sins of the past being the burning of fossil fuels for, you know, roughly, uh, if, well, if you only start with oil 150 years ago, uh, roughly, 
Uh, but basically, responding to 21st century activities will require CC, will be, require carbon capture and, and sequestration. Utilization should be in there. And then I said, if necessary, climate interventions, of which carbon dioxide removal, by the way, is a climate intervention uh, itself. Uh, but then, you know, it's not just enough to atone for the sins of the past. We also have to think about how we change business as usual. How do we change to a, to a civilization that no longer is adding to the problem? And so that involves essentially moving to a zero to negative carbon emission civilization. Lots of aspects to that, some, some of which um, people can do as individuals and others that we have to do as, um, as uh, communities. So the uh, question is, what should PPPL's contribution be? Whenever I take on um, some kind of a leadership role, the first thing I want to do is understand what is the talent that exists and how can we leverage that talent to do what we want to do perhaps in new areas. And so it turns out that PPPL, Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, of course, which is the national lab for, for fusion energy and, pla and plasma sciences, has world leading strengths in plasma sciences and in computational sciences related to complex fluids that are, you know, that are plasmas. And so that, that's part of it. And, the, and you know, my charge is essentially to myself is to deepen the partnerships with Princeton, with, uh, with GFDL that you all uh, know, know and love, and, uh, and industry and other national laboratories and universities. So one could, this is very broad. And so obviously you have to, through this filter and lens, what are the things that PPPL can bring and contribute to? And so there are two of them. One is we've started, uh, this was after talking with a lot of people and then holding a retreat to sort of get a sense of the level of enthusiasm just about a year ago um, uh, that involved people from, from, uh, from all over the Princeton University campus as well as PPPL. We decided to uh, start an initiative in so-called electro manufacturing. What's the idea? The idea again, refers back to the fact that we need to change industrial sectors to rip off the, the band-aid of fossil fuel driven thermal processes and find ways through research and development and deployment to, to, to put on the front end the energy inputs in terms of clean energy and in particular clean electricity because electricity is much more efficient than, um, than heat. And so uh, we recognize then that if you, could, if you can use electricity that is that is de decarbonized, right? That is, de by decarbonized, I just mean um, is carbon emission free, uh, then we can help essentially reduce those emissions uh, perhaps to, to zero within this in, in industrial sector. And so in particular, we want to exploit the fact that there are experts in plasma science that can uh, um, essentially use plasmas and or just straight electricity, for example, through electrolysis. That's the, re um, the research that I do. Um, in my group, and, uh, and use those, that, those forms of energy and the knobs that they offer uh, to enhance cat catalytic, uh, so catalysis, so catalytic transformations of, of materials, uh, of, of molecules and materials, and uh, pyrolysis, so that's essentially the burning in the absence of oxygen, um, uh, so the decomposition of, of various um, Various molecules, for example, you can make clean hydrogen that way. Uh, that's actually being done at, at PPPL from, from methane. Uh, uh, using it for synthesis, using it for recycling uh, for critical materials to basically produce solid forms of carbon and clean hydrogen, for example. Uh, we believe uh, that we will be able to use our strengths in this area to transform all sorts of industries, the ones listed here, by tapping into PPPL's expertise in reactor design, so large-scale reactor design, and low-temperature and non-thermal plasma research that already uh, is, is active at PPPL in the areas of plasma etching and plasma deposition for microelectronics and, and quantum fabrication. So we're going to do it in this, in this new area. The second area has to do with solar radiation management. So this is a cartoon showing sunlight being reflected off of something. And in particular, the something that has been suggested is to, as probably everybody in this audience knows, to inject aerosols at different altitudes um, into the atmosphere that could potentially either reflect sunlight or thin clouds so that you could end up um, having more of the infrared radiation that comes um, from the hot earth 
uh, basically get out and uh, into outer space. So um, what, what do we want to do here? Because I know that um, this usually sends chills through everybody to even think about doing this, and it sends chills through me as well. The issue is the following. We have been so afraid of what might happen that we haven't done the basic science to understand what is really going on with aerosols. So the proposal is to actually do well-controlled experiments in a laboratory, not out in the field, as well as modeling, and have a setup of virtuous cycle between the great climate modeling that goes on at GFDL and on, and on campus, and have those folks, they're already doing it, telling us what are the known unknowns Obviously, we can't really do much about the unknown unknowns, but what are the known unknowns? And in particular, the main known unknown is that we don't understand how aerosols interact with each other, how they interact with clouds, and, how, and we don't have um, enough un understanding of how they absorb or reflect light. And so the fact that we don't know this is really problematic, both from a national security as well as a global security perspective, because it is actually not that hard to inject aerosols into the atmosphere. And so you can imagine a rogue state deciding to do that, and we would not know how to respond. We would not know the outcome because we don't understand the aerosol microphysics and microchemistry well enough. It's on us as scientists and engineers to do that under controlled conditions where there's just you know, no possibility of harm to make those measurements, feed that in in information back into climate models, understand how things might proceed if there were such injections so that we would know what would happen if somebody decided to do this or if the planet reached a point where we had tried everything we could through CCUS, uh, through uh, decarbonizing, quote unquote. I prefer defossilizing, but anyway. Um, and, um, and we still were in a point where we had reached a possible tipping point in terms of global warming. If we get to that point, we may have to do this for a while. And if we have to do this kind of intervention for a while, we sure should know the science behind it before we do it, OK? So I think that's super important. And, um, and the idea is that this really taps into PPPL's expertise in in situ diagnostics and computational modeling of complex turbulent fluids, uh, including charged fluids. That's what plasmas are. They know how to do this. Um, one could argue, in fact, that things are even a little simpler in the atmosphere. Um, I'm not going to have a big debate about that, but I think the, the, uh, the expertise is there. And it's a, one of these great examples um, of pivoting expertise to a new problem that I think we could do. OK, so that's where we're headed. Uh, I thought I'd give a couple of examples. Um, I have to say that I shamelessly um, stole and slightly edited these slides from uh, my uh, colleague and full disclosure husband, Bruce Kale, who's a professor in uh, chemical and biological engineering here. So um, the next few slides are going are, are to show some examples uh, from both his lab as well as other people's lab um, to, to understand the kinds of things you can do with plasmas. So uh, this, is, this is I refer to as plasma-assisted chemical and material conversion. The idea is. Let me, let me just level set what, what a plasma is. A plasma is just an ionized gas. In a fusion uh, plasma, you've stripped all the electrons off of all the atoms. Way, way not what we're doing here. Okay, this is low temperature plasmas that have a bunch of neutral molecules, at, um, atoms in the gas phase. A few, say 1% of them are, uh, have maybe lost an electron or maybe two, but, but usually no more than one electron. And then you've got a bunch of free electrons running around, called a low temperature plasma. And what you can make, then you have this mixture of neutrals, ions, and electrons. And you can use those to, you could actually tune the electron energy even separately from the, um, the ion slash neutral en uh, energy. And that allows you to have multiple knobs to essentially do different kinds of chemistry. You can also essentially have vibrationally excited uh, species, electronically excited species. And essentially, I mean, this looks like a big mess, but I just want you to see that you have all this stuff going on, lots of different knobs to tune. And in particular, 
What, um, what I want to point out is that if you, if you just have catalysis, you, the knobs you have to tune are the actual catalyst, so usually those are metals, the support that it sits on, so these are usually oxides, and then you, know, you can change essentially the pressure and the, and, and the gas flow rate and the temperature, the operating conditions. You add plasmas in and you turn on a bunch of new possibilities. You turn on the fact that you have a whole bunch of different types of plasmas and, re, um, and reactors. You can change the voltage, the current, you know, on and on. And essentially, this allows you then to have control over the electron density, the electron energy, the amount of excitation that goes into electron and vibration, uh, electronic and vibrational excitation of the molecules. So you have a, a situation then where you, you have all these knobs to tune that you can tune to improve efficiency and tune selectivity. And there can be synergistic effects between the plasma and the catalyst, actually. Um, and, um, and that's the kind of thing that we want to, uh, to exploit here. So I'm going to give you one example here, which is uh, essentially looking at how the electrons in a plasma can their energy can be transferred into different channels of ex excitation in, for example, a hydrogen plasma, a nitrogen plasma. Suppose you wanted to make ammonia synthesis by some other means other than the typical way, which is the Haber-Bosch process, which is over 100 years old and um, is very energy intensive and uh, involves um, uh, a lot of CO2 emissions. So if you could do it with a plasma, uh, you can tune. It's thought that, uh, that you might want to actually tune um, to this particular. This is the uh, amount of energy loss, the fraction of energy loss, and this is the electron energy. You want to tune to have electron energies that will excite, ex vibrationally excite nitrogen um, and, and preferentially do that over anything else. So that's kind of a goal. Um, and uh, you know, so. That's the kind of thing that people are working on. One question that immediately arises is, we have Haber-Bosch. OK, yes, it emits CO2 because it's a thermally driven process and, and also because of the way the hydrogen is produced currently. But it is the case that it works pretty well. It's not too expensive. Um, and so you know, what if, if we think about doing this kind of thing, how do we compare the energy to produce ammonia with a plasma versus the energy to produce it with Haber-Bosch. And so it turns out that there are clever ways to use, for example, pulsed nanosecond, so billionth of a second pulses of plasma can achieve ammonia synthesis um, with an efficiency that's about at a quarter of the lab scale of Haber-Bosch currently. So that was done about five years ago. And this is all very new kinds of, of, of research that's going on. And so to get to within a factor of four, uh, you know, of something that is of the order of, you know, more than 100 years old is not so bad and says it's worth pursuing. And there are lots of interesting things that people are doing to improve the efficiency further, including Yevgeny Reitzis at PPPL has developed um, different electrode configurations that allow you to tune these electron energies just where you might want them. And then uh, Igor Adamovich at Ohio State uh, for example, has, has combined different, different high voltage short pulses with low voltage uh, radio frequency pulses that allow you to both have ionization and vibrational excitation. So you can tune all of these different things. Really exciting time in this field. OK, and then I'm going to show you, uh, so that's something you can do in terms of catalysis. What about preparing the catalysts themselves? So it turns out um, most electrocatalysts uh, use platinum, which of course is a very expensive metal. And, um, and so it's hard to think about uh, large scale deployment of something that involves large amounts of platinum. So there's lots of interest in developing substitutes for platinum. And you can use plasmas to, for example, prepare tungsten carbide, which is much cheaper and is actually isoelectronic with platinum and can do some of the kinds of catalysis that platinum does by essentially uh, if, you, if you take a, a sample of, of tungsten carbide, it's usually covered with graphite, but you can selectively etch away the graphite. That's what's shown here using an oxygen plasma pretreatment. -treat, pre so you can, you can prepare the surface just the way you want it. The other thing you could do is dope it. You can essentially use plasmas using a nitrogen plasma. You can dope, in this case, a hafnium oxyhydroxide um, uh, um, material that turns out to have 
amazing performance um, that is uh, able to split water and is acid stable to make hydrogen and, and, and oxygen um, at essentially the same performance as platinum. Okay, so that is, well, of course, you know, you may say, you may know, hafnium is expensive. You're using a lot less hafnium in this hafnium oxyhydroxide than you would be in, in pure platinum. And um, so this is, uh, again, this is work from Bruce Kale's lab uh, here at, at, at Princeton. Okay, and then an just another example of how plasmas uh, can do uh, something very practical and super important in the sustainability space. This is uh, a company that's been spun out um, from Princeton, you may have read about it, uh, uh, co-founded co by Bruce Kale and Yi Guangzhou from, from MAE, as well as two of their postdocs, um, Xiao uh, Fan, um, uh, I forgot to use his last name. Um, anyway, uh, and, uh, and, uh, Cha, and I know their first name, Xiao Fan and, 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 and Chao, I'm, 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 I'm blanking on their last name, sorry about that. But anyway, um, what, what this does is, is takes spent uh, lithium ion batter, battery cathode materials, li so lithium cobalt oxide, and uses a, pro a proprietary plasma process that actually can completely recycle and, and, and basically restore uh, the, uh, the uh, performance of lithium ion battery cathodes. So it is the, actually the first direct recycling process for lithium ion battery cathodes, which of course are extremely important um, in, in electrification of vehicles, and, and they are in our, in our laptops and everything else. Anyway, the point is you get, you're able to get back um, completely clean um, lithium cobalt oxide, whereas all the other processes for recycling batteries, first of all, they're not being done to first order because it creates, uses either a huge amount of energy because they essentially just heat it up, they smelt it, they heat it to very high temperatures, again, a thermal process, CO2 emissions again, um, and you recover essentially the individual elements and then you have to remanufacture the, the, the battery cathode. The other option is, um, is liquefaction by using lots of acid, which of course creates lots of liquid hazardous waste this process has been analyzed by Argonne National Labs to actually use uh, um, a, a, a very little, uh, generate very little waste and use very little uh, um, energy by comparison to any other um, uh, process. So this is, I think, a really exciting direction as well, is recycling um, of, of, of battery materials and others. Okay, very quickly, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, I have one slide about my own research. I figured you should hear something about that. I am a theorist. I develop and apply quantum mechanics methods um, that allow us to study the behavior of molecules and materials. And for over 15 years now, I've been focused entirely on sustainable energy technologies. This is a, um, a graphic that two of my postdocs, one of whom um, is still working with me. Um, he's now a research staff scientist, Mark Martirez. The other is Rob Wexler, who's now a professor at, at Wash U, um, put together um, as, because I am terrible at, at putting together graphics, and they put together this as a cover art for a Festschrift issue that appeared two years ago in the Journal of Physical Chemistry. And it's essentially just showing that all the work I do starts with the Schrodinger equation. So we solve for the energies and the electron distribution, and use that to predict the properties of molecules and materials. The corners show the different kinds of theories that we, that I and my group have developed over, you know, more than 30 years, and the different kinds of, of um, applications that uh, we've worked on over the years. Uh, most of, whoops, that's nice. Um, much, much of which has to do. Okay, this is this is this is fun. Um, most, most, most of which has to do with, maybe you can put this back together while I keep talking, thank you. Um, and I can do it from over here, actually. Um, most of which have to do with energy technologies. And in particular, what you see on the left are different kinds of projects that are now completed that have to do with clean electricity. And um, thank you. Uh, and uh, as well as biofuels. And But what I'm working on these days has to do with um, sustainable fuels and chemicals. And so these are projects that are, that are still going on. 
Um, and these are more recent projects. And I'll notice you should see here, I, I just uh, have um, agreed to start a project related to um, ammonia synthesis um, with HMEI and, and BP. So I'm excited about that. OK, that's all I'm going to say about, about research. If you want to talk to me about my research at some other point, we can do that. Now, let me say a few words about this study. You can go to this website, which I'm sure you can't, um, you're not going to write that down. Uh, but um, that this is the first report that came out that looked at status and opportunities for carbon utilization, markets, and infrastructure. So not about R&D. R&D is going to come in the next, the next report. Uh, anyway, I just want to level set everybody. Probably everybody in this audience knows that uh, here are how, here, here's how we generate CO2 emissions. We hope that uh, the power sector, the transportation sector, and a lot of industry will eventually um, uh, be mitigated so that in this net zero future, uh, the, this energy transition will get rid of uh, fossil fuel combustion. And that what's left in industry that can't easily be decarbonized would go to um, geological storage. Um, and some of it will go to, um, to usage. And so, uh, so in fact, CO2 utilization is one part of carbon management, and that's the part that this study is about. So let me define from the beginning, the scope of the study was not to look at utilization, for example, through physical use of CO2. So it didn't include uh, carbonated beverages, right, where the CO2 is just dissolved. It doesn't include enhanced oil recovery, where the CO2, again, doesn't change. What is important here, it also doesn't include CO2 absorption by plants, OK? So uh, it, it is just looking at chemical transformations of CO2 from the atmosphere, water, uh, bodies of water, waste gas streams into marketable products. OK, so that's also important. It can't be that it's just doing enhanced weathering of rocks or something like that. It has to be that it's making a marketable product. Um, what's important to recognize, so I'm just trying to get, pull out a few of the key findings and recommendations that are, I thought would be interesting to you. Uh, certainly not all of them. So the, you know, it's clear that climate impacts um, of these kinds of CO2 utilization processes will depend on the product that you're making, how long will it live, the CO2 source, um, and emissions from other inputs. So you can imagine that you might need clean hydrogen and electricity uh, because CO2 is very stable. And to convert it to anything, you need, you need to put in energy. So for example, with respect to lifetime, um, you can think about CO2 reacting with minerals of some sort and producing uh, mineral carbonates um, that could essentially be used as building products. And um, that would have a product lifetime you know, presumably of over a century, and you, that would be considered durable carbon storage. I've learned that, uh, it's so interesting, you start interacting with people in different communities and you learn that you can't say permanent. You can say durable, because we don't know how long permanent really is. Okay, the other point though, if you think about making chemicals and fuels, well, chemicals and fuels eventually will go on to CO2 when they degrade. So they have a product lifetime that's less than 100 years. So if you think about taking CO2 to chemicals and fuels, I already mentioned you need things like clean hydrogen and electricity. The best you can hope for is a circular carbon economy. The best you can hope for. OK. I see the sign. Thank you. OK. So um, let me uh, dig into that slightly more. We have to think about the source and the product and, uh, and the, essentially the the source of the CO2 and what products it's going to make to understand how you can get to a sustainable CO2 utilization. In particular, if your source is a fossil source, so a lot of us have thought for a long time that you should immediately go to power plants or, or fossil sources like that that have a high concentration of CO2 in their waste stream. That should be easier to deal with. But if you make a short-lived product, all you're doing is delaying emissions. You're not, it's not sustainable. The only way to make it sustainable is to make a long-lived product. That would be net zero emissions compatible. Okay? Um, on the other hand, if you take CO2 from, direct, from air or from ocean or from biogenic sources um, that had already absorbed CO2 from the atmosphere, for example, 
You could make either long-lived products, which actually correspond to net negative emissions, because um, you're taking it out and you're, you're sticking it in a product, typically a solid, that won't change um, over time. Um, or if you go to short-lived products, just like I showed you on the previous slide, this would be net zero or circular economy um, compatible. Bottom line is that if we start thinking about developing fuels and chemicals from CO2, it has to come from direct air capture, direct ocean capture, or biogenic CO2. It cannot come from fossil fuels, fossil uh, source uh, CO2. So it's important to do a full life cycle analysis to understand that when you're thinking about developing you know, your next company. OK, I'm not going to go through all these because I was just told I had five minutes left. So I just want to say that we, in this report, looked at all of these different issues from the point of the source, the capture technologies, the level of purification one needs um, just to do CO2 transport, the different kinds of transport, um, the extra purification you might need before you start uh, doing your CO2 utilization processes. There's lots of different processes here, as well as all the inputs you need to think about, all the infrastructure associated with that, and then finally product transport. So there's a if I, I wrote here, this was not in the original uh, uh, slide, the slide deck from the National Academies, that essentially this is a superset of CCS infrastructure requirements. You're going to need all of this plus storage up to this point. But then you need all of this added on for utilization. It's not trivial. OK, in terms of infrastructure design for CO2 utilization, you have to weigh Essentially, do you want to transport inputs or do you want to transport outputs, products? So we want to look at the ease of transporting these different inputs versus transporting products. You also, when you're thinking about, and when investors are thinking about um, uh, putting together utilization, you have to think about the long-term availability of CO2 from point sources. Presumably, those are going to go away if we move to a decarbonized society. We're not going to have fossil fuels. So you have to worry about those stranded assets. Um, and then there's system level trade-offs. And so you could imagine having centralized infrastructure um, that would essentially uh, allow you to avoid CO2 transport at all. So in other words, if you have a point source, put a utilization facility next to that point source along with inputs, you know, making hydrogen on site, for example, and bringing in uh, decarbonized electricity, and then just transport the product. Um, other possibility is distributed infrastructure where you could accommodate small emitters um, like ethanol plants and, um, or cement plants. And, uh, and then you, know, you would have a, a flexible CO2 capture location. But then what you have to do is have a way of aggregating all the CO2 sources and to deliver all the inputs. So it's not trivial. We believe it's important to think about co-location to minimize transport. And that would involve, for example, if I have this fossil uh, power plant and I I'm you know, in, in a city, I can imagine making building uh, materials nearby um, uh, to just take advantage of minimizing transport. And then you could imagine that if you already have a, an existing chemical manufacturing plant and you, and you have energy and hydrogen inputs, you could, you could uh, tack on a direct air capture facility to essentially allow you to have circular economy. So there are, are many other things to say in this report. Uh, that I urge you to go ahead and read, but I want you to um, know that one of the things we, we pointed out is that the sort of low-hanging fruit, fruit of making sustainable aviation fuels from biogenic CO2, for example, from ethanol plants, or for making um, durable carbon removal from any source of CO2. And then I'm almost at the end here. Um, the other idea was essentially to build industrial clusters that could essentially piggyback onto what's going to be done, potentially, if we are allowed, for geologic sequestration from all sources of CO2, and build in utilization plants that allow you to get to all these different products. Um, OK, so that's what I wanted to tell you about the CO2 report. Last bit is to just say, God forbid, all else fails. Um, we have to think about these, these um, aerosol injection ideas. So the stratospheric aerosol injection, cirrus cloud thinning, um, and marine cloud brightening. Uh, these are different mechanisms for reflecting sunlight here and cirrus cloud for getting the heat out. The fact is that, um, and, I, and I need to, to thank uh, um, uh, Luke Dyke in particular, 
um, and, and whoever else he corralled, probably Marissa Weichmann, um, uh, for, uh, I, I've probably edited the slide slightly, but it's mostly his slide. Um, uh, it's been a joy working with them uh, uh, on, on thinking about this. Anyway, um, so critical to, we, to understand aerosol cloud light interactions, crucial to any future solar radiation management strategies. And as I mentioned, the climate models are, have, have high levels of uncertainty, especially with respect to aerosol cloud interactions, but also aerosol aerosol interactions, and um, even just understanding the, the amount of radiated forcing by aerosols. So we are launching. In fact, there was a um, the call for proposals went out. It's been really a joy working with Gabe um, on crafting uh, the, the call for proposals along with uh, a couple of other folks um, to launch an international collaboration that's going to include Princeton University, PPPL, and GFDL to determine these known unknowns. So we'll see where we get. So just a quick summary. Um, we are trying to move beyond just sustainable energy, but also to the sustainable transformation of everything else. And that involves, PPPL involves this electromanufacturing science initiative. I think we have to do the solar radiation management science as a backstop. That's why we started this initiative at PPPL, GFDL, Princeton University, and Simons. Um, I'm working on this carbon management because I think we have to, with the National Academies and the committee there, um, because I think CDR, carbon dioxide removal, and sustainable utilization is going to be a part of our future. We need to understand all the aspects of it. These are just uh, the kinds of things I'm working on with my group now, which is electricity-driven transformations mostly um, that involve production of fuels and chemicals by catalysis means. And I, I want to end by thanking um, the entire PPPL, GFDL, PU ecosystem, Steve Kelly in particular, because he had this idea along with Debbie Prentice to um, build these, these new bridges, taking advantage of the new focus in Washington, and brought me back to do this work. Um, uh, David Spurgle, it's been great working with him um, to, to uh, envision this, this first tranche of, of investment in, this, in the solar radiation management. DOE Office of Science has been super uh, supportive. And um, my research group, past and present, way too long a list, but especially Mark Martirez, who's been, um, who's now a research staff member at PPPL, who's been working with me now for uh, eight years. Um, and uh, it's just been a joy. And then my current research group, um, quite small now, um, as a result of um, the, my previous gig uh, running a very large university. And, um, but it's been a joy working with uh, Nick Boyd and Ziyang Wei, and Ben Bobel is an undergraduate here, um, and the National Academy staff um, and study committee, especially uh, the leaders on the staff side, Beth Zittler, who, by the way, is an Andy Bacarsley uh, PhD. I was on her committee, but she's been at the National Academies for nine years now, um, and Catherine Wise. And with that, um, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Emily. This was great. And now uh, we have time for some questions, answers, discussions, uh, including people on Zoom. And as I've tried to do for the semester and a half, two semesters or so, uh, I would encourage and prefer if the first question came from a student or a postdoc. And Emily's been talking for a while, so she will enjoy the quiet and calm, and we will wait. And let's wait for the mic. Thank you. Great talk. Um, so you said you're trying to electrify industry, um, but what is, what is the plan um, to electrify industries such as cement and um, steel manufacturing that like, need such energy inputs? In yeah, it's a, good, energy, it's a great right? question. I didn't have time to talk about it. So um, in fact, uh, as a result of this electromanufacturing initiative, community building exercise, uh, Claire White, who's a professor in civil environmental engineering, OK? Ah, oh, there you go. So Claire has gotten together with other people, including Yevgeny Reitzis at, at PPPL, um, to propose with BASF, uh, plasma-driven uh, cement production uh, proposal to the uh, e, to EERE, so to the energy efficiency renewable energy part of the Department of Energy. 
So there are many, I think there are lots of opportunities that are unexplored for that. In the steel industry, in fact, electricity is already used, right? There's electric arc uh, uh, production of, of, of steel. Um, and, uh, and there's also um, direct reduction, or there's, okay, there's, there's several different ways in which electricity is, is used already in the steel industry. I think there are opportunities for plasmas, potentially, um, in refining of ores. Uh, hasn't been looked at at all. I think it's really exciting. And, uh, and also other ways to use electricity and, and plasmas in, in various parts of the steel industry. So absolutely, thanks for bringing it up. So uh, now we, we seem to have a question there, and then forest, and then here. Hello, thanks. Um, so for the talk, I guess we really focused on kind of the science behind all this technology, but I guess I'm really curious about kind of the political part of it, because to do anything like what you're talking about, where you're putting um, carbon capture next to industry or industry next to carbon capture, you need sustained um, push, right, from all sides of the equation. And I think perhaps the American political system doesn't really allow you as a government to push either idea in whichever way, because every four years, you, or every two years, you get these, you know, power struggles. So I guess from someone who's more embedded in the Department of Energy or the National Academies, what what do you see really in like the long, short, long term of this? Yeah, it's a great question, and that's why I, I you know, I said that it's not clear that CCS will take off. Right? Um, I think that. There's a couple things. If you think about development of technologies, what, pe what investors need to see is certainty. And that's something that governments, at least in the US, have not been good at, okay? Because, and so the more in which uh, we can agree over long term that there will be at the, you know, at the start of, of new technologies sustained subsidies, until they're, they are able to, to support themselves and take off, that's gonna be really critical for any of this to work, to get to the point that you can beat, you know, people can see a path that makes sense to beat business as usual, which is fossil fuels, number one. Number two is this issue about community engagement. I think that it is so critical, and I, I, I am sure that I am, uh, you know, guilty of this as much as, as any scientist, which is that we think if we just sit down and we educate the public, um, they'll of course get it, right? And they'll see the importance of it. It's just not that simple. I think we have to be humble. We have to go into communities and listen to them first before we say anything. Tell us what your issues are. Tell us what you're afraid of. Let's, let's work together to understand if there are ways that we can make sure that those fears are, are taken care of. Because otherwise, you know, this happens with, with lots of new technologies. It, it won't happen. So I think there's a concerted effort that is needed to make sure that at the very early moments where we're thinking about any kind of project, that we go in and we, we talk to the communities First to listen, understand what they have experienced and, and see if there is a way that in fact we can make their lives better um, as a result of that technology, not just globally, but locally, right? And so one of the things is, and I know, I don't know if Denise is here, but Denise Moseral, hi Denise. So, you know, Denise has focused a lot on co-benefits that come out of work that you would do to mitigate against uh, climate change that also helps improve air, air quality, okay, local air quality. So pointing that out, that if you, for example, move from a, uh, you know, a fossil fuel uh, driven power plant that's going to emit particulates and hurt air quality locally to something which is electrified, right, um, that uh, is with clean electricity, I think that's the kind of way, if you could help people see that there are ways to improve their local lives as well as, as the global situation, we have a chance. So. 
Okay, so I'm going to walk this to Forrest, and then the next one is oh, here. <laughs> Thanks, Emily, for like the millionth time for being amazing. Um, I hope my question isn't too much in the weeds, but I'm going to blame it on you for in part hiring me because I'm obsessed with exergy. And so my question is about this thermal energy problem. So we have all these processes like the ammonia that we talked about in Haber-Bosch, and then you just mentioned cement. And those require like huge amounts of heat input. But what I'm not so sure about, and maybe it's just I don't understand, is for plasmas, if they're very specifically generated by electricity, the difference between generating thermal energy, which can be a direct primary energy use, versus electricity, which often has a lot of upstream production costs and so forth, which then challenge you know, other people in policy and energy storage arenas about do we have capacity to make this switch over? I'm just curious how much, when I look at the slide that says it's 0.35 for the plasma ammonia and 1.5 or whatever it was for the thermal, how much do you have to start to think about these larger issues of where the electricity gets generated and whether that needs to be projected or how difficult is that? Yeah, so thanks Forrest. And, and one of my, I feel like a proud parent, okay? I'm so delighted that I, I, that I and, and uh, your colleagues in, in architecture um, brought you here. So it's been fantastic. Um, so, um, what I would say is, yeah, you have to think about the full life cycle analysis. Okay, and one of the real challenges here is we don't have enough, uh, and you know, it's, a, it's, it's part of the full report, but we clearly don't have enough clean electricity to do this. And in fact, one of the things we say, and Rob Sokolow, who I saw earlier, who's around, yes, Rob, would 100% agree, because we've had this conversation before, is that you should never do CO, you know, CU if you have a better use for that clean electricity, right? You should use that clean electricity first, just as electricity to do you know, the normal things. So in order to do this, we have to greatly expand the amount of clean electricity we have. And so that um, is critical. Now, one thing you have to understand is that the, what's interesting about electricity that is much more difficult with thermal is heat is very hard to turn on and off. Electricity, you can, you can do those nanosecond pulses. You can use much less electricity as a result if you can do these things in a, in a way that takes advantage of a very cool thing. So I, one project, um, my postdoc, Zi Yong Wei, and, and is working on, um, uh, and, um, and also um, uh, my research staff member, Mark Martira, is with me and with Yi Guang Ju and with others at the University of Maryland, um, and Argonne, actually, is a project that looks at pulsed heating and quenching using um, resistive heating, so electricity, to create pu quick pulses so that you, the energy inputs are optimized both because you end up using le less electricity, you know, less energy, but there are the, the problem with thermal processes is that you get a lot of processes happening you don't want to have happen. Decomposition of things, poisoning of things. There are ways to tune it in such a way that you get the right reaction to happen and you don't get the bad decomposition to happen because you quenched it before it could happen. So that I think is such a cool you know, thing to be working on. Um, the PI on that is, is Bing Hu at the University of Maryland. It's, it's really interesting work. Oh, there. Um, thank you so much. This is a really lovely talk. Um, I, I would just love to hear your thoughts on uh, if you uh, just kind of as as we develop new technologies and clean industries, how do we kind of avoid um, other mistakes of rapid industrialization and the fossil fuel industry, for example, like uh, kind of, you know, exploitation of indigenous communities and land. And also when we think about like long term products, as you're talking about, like, how do we know um, what will happen in the future? Like when, how do we avoid, I guess, like pushing problems down the road? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's an open-ended question in the sense that, you know, it's very hard to predict what will happen in the future. All we, ha all we can do is try to learn from the past mistakes and anticipate. And I think, again, being really mindful, and this first report talks about it, reaching out to communities early to have those discussions, because if you don't have those discussions early, um, you're almost set, you've almost set yourself up to have a project fail, 
okay, or be delayed and be more costly, et cetera. So let's design, let's do co-design. That's actually a DOE buzzword, so I apologize. But co-design where you've got the users and the people that are, the stakeholders, the, the people who are affected by it, in it from the very beginning, understanding what are the issues to make sure we don't um, make those same mistakes. So while I wait to see if there are questions here in the physical audience, we have two questions here in Zoom. And um, the first question is, is uh, Emily, do you see any potential for common work with the cloud as, all, as an acronym collaboration at CERN uh, that is working to reduce uh, cloud radio forcing uncertainty? And then the next question is, uh, which or what private sector uh, carbon utilization companies do you find most exciting? And, and uh, I'll see how you, you choose to answer that second one. Okay. <laughs> so um, with respect to the cloud uh, at CERN, um, I, uh, I, will, I will fully state that I am not the, the expert in this area, but I'm a good delegator. And so, um, uh, Luke Dyke and Stefan uh, Hugestaller um, spoke with the CERN Cloud Chamber folks um, on behalf of this new initiative and learned what uh, they and also there's a, a Cloud Chamber uh, effort um, uh, in, in Karlsruhe uh, that um, those are sort of the leading efforts in, in Europe. And we wanted to understand uh, or what I, at least I wanted to understand, and they, they got the technical details about, is if they had to do it all over again, what would they do, how would they design it in terms of it being designed the same way, and what would they do differently? So that we could, from the very beginning, learn from their, uh, their uh, what worked well and what, what they would have preferred to do differently. I will say my understanding is that neither one of those chambers is focused on the stratospheric aerosol um, injection conditions that we are uh, we want to focus on, and so I think we will have um, our hope is to convince the Department of Energy to uh, recognize the strengths, uh, the intellectual strengths, and the engineering strengths, um, both at Princeton and PPPL and, and GFDL, as a just the perfect ecosystem to build a facility, and we have a white paper into them which we haven't heard on yet uh, to. Um, to do exactly that, um, and so we hope that uh, we will end up um, having a facility that can be used by people all over the world, just like uh, the situation in Karlsruhe um, uh, in particular. I'm not sure how, how, how many people have access to the CERN uh, chamber. So that's the CERN answer. And then the answer with respect to which carbon utilization uh, companies or technologies, which, which one did it say? What did it, it said say? companies, but you can companies. interpret it as technologies. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I actually am pretty excited about Lanza Tech. Um, I should be careful here. I'm not sure I should say anything. Be just because, because I'm in this you know, position uh, so I'm speaking on, my, on behalf of myself, not on behalf of the National Academies Report. I should say that from the beginning on all of what I've just said. Um, and um, so far, I've heard Lanzatech folks speak a couple of different times. They have um, developed optimized enzymes for essentially taking CO2 eventually all the way to um, sustainable aviation fuels. I think that's really important. Um, I don't know, and, and they, have come, they have pilots slash, you know, I don't know, plant, plants of various sizes that are being built in a number of different countries. I think that's really quite exciting. Um, there are several companies that are working on, uh, that, have, that have products for uh, CO, CO2 going into cement technology, so more sustainable cement. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I think there's still a lot of room my impression is a lot of room for improvement with respect to the carbon capture side of companies and technologies, um, uh, just in terms of the daunting scale that is involved. There's also, I think, some very interesting couple of companies that are working on direct air, a direct ocean capture of CO2. Um, and uh, um, I've forgotten the name of 
I, I know the name of one of them, um, but I, I shouldn't say anything because I am sort of tangentially in, involved in it. Very, I mean, not a formal involvement, but so I'll just say that there are some companies that are doing interesting work, and, and this is something that we're working on. Um, my postdoc, Nick, Nick Boyne, is in, and also Mark Martirez are working on um, looking at the, the as, aspects of how you optimize taking CO2 out of the oceans. And um, I think it's really important. It's, it's very promising because the amount of CO2, the concentration of CO2 in the oceans is 150 times higher than it is in the air. So it could, in principle, be much easier to take, to take it out of, out of the oceans. Um, so those are the things I'm, I would say, the most excited about right now. So I think that, that's good. Uh, it's a good way, I think. Uh, I was just flashed the sign. Unfortunately, we are at the, the right before I get pulled off the stage. But we've ended with uh, this semester with, I think, a, a very hopeful and forward-looking um, presentation. Um, and I, I would like to first thank Emily again. Thank you so much. Um, and then I would, I would like to thank all of you in, in our virtual and in-person audience. Uh, I think uh, you've brought energy and interest and curiosity. I think that that is fantastic. And I look forward to seeing you again in September. But I know that you are going to be really, really missing us. So uh, what we've done is uh, between now and September is the end of May, which is reunions. And we have arranged for a special uh, forum uh, during reunions. So hopefully some of you will be able to come. It will be a forum on climate change, uh, science, uh, policy, and solutions, where we have Professor Stefan Fuglestaller is going to be one of our panelists, along with an illustrious cast of alumni spanning climate science, climate communication, climate policy, and climate solutions. And uh, we expect this to be uh, a very energetic exchange. Uh, and uh, so uh, keep your eye on it. Is it the Friday of reunions, which is what, the 24th of May? 26th of May, and it is going to be at 2.30 p.m. in one of the Robertson Bowls. So keep your eye out for that. Uh, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, uh, don't tell your non-friends. Uh, and uh, until then, we will see you in September and uh, keep up the energy. Thank you. Thank you.